Everybody's all set? Morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I want to thank our host here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. It's humbling to be in this living memorial to humanity and history. You'll hear from Michael Glickman. He's the president and CEO of this museum in a moment or two. Then you'll hear from uh, Mayor de Blasio. Then Chief Lori Pollack will go over the October crime figures for you. First, I want to congratulate everyone who participated in and who worked in the New York City Marathon on Sunday. It's an enormous task and an amazing feat for all involved. I want to thank all the men and women in uniform who stood out there on footposts or who walked amid the crowds in regular street clothes, who sat in offices or vehicles pouring over the constant stream of intelligence coming in, the type of information that has become commonplace and necessary, not just for large events like the marathon, but for the hard work of everyday policing in New York City these days. Truly, it's an impressive undertaking, and my hat is off to every member of the NYPD. Second, Michael, I want to thank you and your staff for allowing us appropriately, appropriately to visit you here and to talk publicly, publicly about New York City's ongoing reductions in crime and to describe what's currently, what we're currently seeing in terms of an increase in bias incidents against different groups, particularly against members of New York's Jewish community. At the NYPD, we have, quite frankly, the best hate crime task force in the nation. The investigators who work under Deputy Inspector Mark Molinari are seasoned professionals who know what they're looking for when it comes to such acts and the motivations behind those acts. The increased reports of swastikas and other criminal mischief here in the five boroughs absolutely concern us. And none of it, none of it will ever be tolerated in New York City. But let me be clear, Robert Bowers, the Pittsburgh shooter, is an anti-Semite fueled by unadulterated hate. He's not just a nut, and it's important for people to make that distinction. Everybody in New York City and in our nation should pay attention to what happened in Pittsburgh and understand it should never, ever happen in the United States of America. Bowers operated under the radar and espoused deep-seated hate against the Jewish community. So I want to repeat the NYPD's constant appeal to the people that we serve, that if you know of anyone harboring similar thoughts or someone who talks about carrying out anything remotely connected to violence against a specific group of people, the NYPD wants to know about it. We need to know about it. Give us a chance to fully investigate by contacting 911 or by calling our toll-free hotline 1-888-NEW-YORK-CITY-SAFE or by flagging down a patrol cop in your neighborhood to let him or her know what you know. This is how we can all share responsibility for our public safety. Only in close partnerships with all the New Yorkers we serve can we continue to prove our unrivaled ability to combat acts of hate in all its various forms. As we near the end of 2018, I'm very optimistic about where we find ourselves. Cops and the people we serve are working together better than we ever have. The NYPD, and our law enforcement partners at the local, state, and federal levels are working in tandem more effectively than any other time in our history. That's the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, the U.S. Marshal Service, the state police, our six district attorneys, the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District, Eastern Districts, the Violence Interrupters, and so many more organizations and groups. Citywide, year-to-date, homicides this year compared to last year are flat. As of this morning, they're actually down, uh, we're down by one. And shootings are down all of which is realized by our precise targeting of the real drivers of crime. And we'll never stop pursuing our primary goal, and that's to fight crime and to keep people safe. But we, as we see here this morning in this museum, we know that's not enough, because all New Yorkers in every neighborhood always need to feel safe too, and that's our ultimate goal. Thanks for your attention. I'm now going to turn it over to Michael Glickman, who's the museum president and CEO. Michael? Thank you, Commissioner. And good morning and welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. We're gathered in New York's Holocaust Museum at a time of mourning for our community and for our country. As we commemorate the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht this week, we remember the cold-blooded murder of Jews at prayer, not just as a matter of historical record, but as a point of breaking news. We carry in our minds the massacre of 11 Jews at Tree of Life Congregation in Pittsburgh 12 days ago. Even as we mourn, we continue to honor the Jewish insistence on the sanctity of human life. And we will, through all of this, support each other. The museum's mission, delivered through the tens of thousands of students and teachers we serve and educate each year, commits us to our unwavering determination to promote tolerance and understanding, especially in times of violence and loss. It is my pleasure and privilege to be with you today and it is my honor to introduce the mayor of the city of New York, Bill de Blasio. 
Thank you so much, Michael. And Michael, I want to thank you and all your colleagues here at the museum for the extraordinary work you do, because this is a place that uh, teaches us history, but history that we must learn from. And uh, I think in this moment where there's a, lot, there's a lot of hatred out there, there's way too much hatred out there, and it's being given too much license, it is very, very pertinent to look back on history and reflect on what went wrong in the past and how we can make sure it does not go wrong here. So, Michael, I, I just want to affirm to you and your colleagues how important your work is and how much it's appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who is here, uh, all the leadership of the NYPD. Uh, we'll talk in a moment about uh, what has been achieved uh, during the last month. And I think it's very impressive. And congratulations to you, Commissioner, and to all of the senior leadership, First Deputy Commissioner Tucker and Chief Monahan, all the leadership here present. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that what we have seen lately, the uptick in hate crimes, has affected many communities. And I want to acknowledge and thank for being here Shirley McKinney, who is the superintendent for Manhattan sites of the National Park Service. Thank you for your important service to this city and this nation. Uh, we know that there was an attack <coughs> on the African Burial Ground National Monument. And there was a hate speech uh, scrawled on the monument. It was an act of vandalism, but also clearly a hate crime. And NYPD is working diligently to bring to justice the individual or individuals who did this. One thing that I always uh, note about the NYPD, is when it comes to hate crimes, they have a very aggressive, consistent approach. It does not matter what community is affronted. Tragically, we're seeing many communities affronted. We're seeing hate crimes towards the African American community, towards the Jewish community, towards the Muslim community, towards the LGBT community. It all has to stop. One of the most powerful tools to ensure that people understand that hate crimes is unacceptable is when they see there are real tangible consequences. And the NYPD has done an outstanding job of ensuring that those individuals who act out of hate are brought to justice. This is the exact opposite of what happened those many years ago on Kristallnacht, 80 years ago, and a poignant, poignant moment uh, that uh, I had with uh, Chief Monaghan when we were at uh, Park East Synagogue uh, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, Pittsburgh attack in solidarity with the Jewish community. And uh, Rabbi Schneier, who talked to us all, talked to the media as well, about being outside his own synagogue in Vienna on Kristallnacht, <clears throat> watching his synagogue burn, and watching uh, the authorities, including even the firefighters, do nothing and just let it burn. Uh, part of what we have to do in New York City is show what it means to have an aggressive, consistent approach to hate crimes, and we've done that, and I'm very, very proud of the work of the NYPD. But it's a message to uh, this entire country and to authorities all around the world that if you do not act aggressively in response to a hate crime, you are inadvertently or purposefully giving it license, and that's something we do not accept here in New York City. With that, I want to talk about uh, the last month. It's been uh, extraordinary, uh, but want to uh, first uh, thank all of the men and women of the NYPD for the exceptional efforts that the commissioner referred to related to the marathon, uh, beautifully organized event, and the NYPD did an extraordinary job keeping it secure. So kudos to everyone involved. In terms of the last month, you'll be hearing more in a moment from Chief Pollock. But we uh, are very uh, proud of what has been achieved by the NYPD and all of its community allies and partners. Total crime down 1.4 percent uh, year to date, and shootings down 4.7 percent, almost 5 percent reduction in shootings year to date. That's extraordinary. Uh, what's also so noteworthy is that all this is being achieved with fewer arrests. So at this point, Arrests are down 13% year-to-date. Uh, extraordinary combination of factors. When I talk to people uh, who are trying to understand how this uh, progress is being made in New York City and who want to emulate it, when I get to the point about the reduction in arrest consistent with the reduction in crime, uh, eyes open wide. 
and the NYPD has done something extraordinary here that bears real study. Uh, it is about keeping us safe and making us safer. It's also about making sure we're the fairest big city in America. And people all over the city are experiencing it and feeling it and appreciating it. The NYPD is doing its job better than ever. Just a couple of words in Spanish. Este mes pasado pudimos ver la velocidad, precisión y valentía del NYPD en los incidentes con bombas y ataques de odio. Nuestro departamento de policía tiene una capacidad única para combatir el odio y el terrorismo y a la vez llevar el crimen a niveles históricamente bajos. Así es como estamos haciendo de Nueva York no solo la ciudad grande más segura del país, sino también la más justa. With that, I want to turn to Chief Pollock, who will go over the details of the crime update. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. We had an overall crime reduction of 7.5% this month. This translates to 664 fewer crimes than last October and we remain on pace for a new record low this year of fewer than 96,000 index crimes. We talk about murder. As always, every murder number on this page represents a person, and we saw a 41% reduction in murder this October, 17 versus 29 last year. This is the lowest murder number for any October. Manhattan saw a dramatic in, uh, de decrease of two versus 13 as the Westside Highway attack claimed eight victims last year, just one mile from where we sit today. Brooklyn saw a decrease of five versus nine. The Bronx was even with last year with five murders. Staten Island was even with one. And Queens saw an, in, an increase of two, four versus two. Year to date, at the end of October, we were plus four murder victims, 248 versus 244. And through last night, we're at 252 murders, which is even with last year. Our shootings. In October, we're down by five, a 7% decrease. This is the lowest shooting number for any October, improving on last year's previous record low. And October 12th through 14th was the first time in 25 years that we had a weekend without any shootings. <clears throat> rape. We were up slightly. Rape reports were up slightly by eight this month, 160 versus 152. 26 reports, or 16% of the total number, were from a previous year. This is a slightly lower out of your reporting percentage than we saw in August, which was 21%, and September, which was 24%. The 16% is on par with last October's 14% out of your reporting. Robbery. Robbery is down 121 crimes, or 10%. This also is the lowest October, this is the lowest October ro robbery number in the Comstat era. Felony assaults. They are down 202 crimes, or 11%. It's the lowest October felony assault number since 2012. Burglary. It's the lowest October number in the Comstat era, down 173 burglaries, a decrease of 15%. Grand larceny is also down 1.5%, a total of 61 grand larcenies. And auto, auto theft is at a new low for October, 486 versus 587, a decrease of 101 thefts, which is down 17%. So thank you very much. Mike. Yep. All right, uh, I'm going to do some on top on crime. Any questions about crime? Yep, the first yeah, round. I'm, I'm hoping the NYPD can speak on the, private, the crackdown on private partners. Um, and yeah, we're going to get to that when we go to off topic. Oh. Miles? All right, come on. <laughs> Dean? In terms of hate crimes, we're just starting with that. What is the NYPD doing to stop? hate crimes, and can you honestly stop them from occurring? Well, Dean, we can't get into people's minds or hearts, but we can certainly do our best to try to stop them, and we do that by actively investigating them with our hate crimes task force and by working in conjunction with everybody in the community. I think everybody in the city has got a responsibility to help uh, uh, make sure that this doesn't happen. Yeah, Dean, I want to add to that. The, there's two ways I think the NYPD uh, fundamentally uh, inhibits hate crime, and the first is by building a stronger relationship with the community so we get information. As the Commissioner said, you know, in, in any instance, any tragedy we've seen, if uh, someone had known something and had gotten it to the police in time, we might have been able to avert those tragedies. Well, I think there's an everyday reality in New York City, whereas the relationship between police and community grows closer, information is flowing that often stops crimes. 
or allows the NYPD to take actions that inhibit crime, uh, including hate crime. Uh, the second piece is consequences. Let's face it, human beings respond to consequences. If the uh, propagator, uh, propagators of hate crime see uh, that there are consequences for others, if they see that justice is swift, it's another important factor in inhibiting other hate crimes. Is that, is there any different strategies or tweaking strategies that you're using going forward that you could share with us? I, I think it's, uh, it's what I said about working, making sure that we work closely with the communities uh, that we're sworn to protect and serve. And, and anybody, the, the biggest thing, especially if it's criminal mischief, which is a little bit more difficult to investigate, is if anybody's a witness, anybody's got any video to come forward. I know we do video, we do extensive video canvases, but uh, if you have anything out there that can help us, I think that would really make the difference. As the mayor said, uh, when we catch people, make sure that there's consequences for that, and we do that by working with the prosecutors also. Yep. In the back row. Any thoughts on why there is an opportunity? I, I think uh, you have to take a look at uh, current atmosphere, I guess. You know, it's, uh, we had this, I think it was about a year and a half ago, we had an uptick also. And then, because uh, actually going through, Dermot, let me know if I'm, I'm going down the wrong road here. In the beginning of the year, we actually saw a decrease in hate crimes. And then just recently, over the last two or three months, we saw a rise. Yeah. Yep, and then, Carol. Yeah, the attack on the, the burial ground, there were like a ton of cameras over there, uh, Holy yeah. Square area. Have you been able to zero in on a face or anything? Uh, Dermot, you want to just talk about that for a second? So the, uh, the incident in the 5th Precinct at the African Burial Ground, you're correct, there are a, a, a large number of cameras in that area. Uh, we have recovered a, uh, several pieces of video, unfortunately none um, that have been put out yet, and the reason for that is uh, they are either from a distance or grainy, nothing really. We want to put something out when we do. I hope that uh, hopefully soon we will have something probative that we can put out that really will start the information coming in. There's been a lot of work on that case. As I said, we're in the process now of, we have a timeline. We know uh, when it occurred, we believe. We, we have extremely grainy video uh, of that occurring and, and we're beginning to track that person on video. So hopefully soon we will have something that can uh, elicit tips to come in, uh, but the work has been, um, behind the scenes occurring with that case. Just, if I could, just in the last two to three weeks, the hate crimes detectives have uh, made an arrest on the Upper West Side of an individual drawing swastikas, charged with numerous incidents. In, in Brooklyn, in the 7-7 and the 9-0 precincts last week, that was the incident where uh, property damaged as well as fires, two different precincts. Hate crimes detectives in a short period of time made an arrest and that. Um, also in Brooklyn in the 8-4 precinct just last week, two individuals drawing uh, on private property swastikas and, and hate messages. So that's three, three just in the last two to three weeks with, uh, as the mayor said and the police commissioner, very swift and certain. And uh, I, I have every confidence that not only in the 5th precinct, but also we have video that we'll be putting out uh, of three incidents that occurred in the 7-9 precinct, all within an hour and a half. Um, last week where an individual had his, was pushed and had his hat knocked off. Then a young girl was pushed to the ground, thankfully not seriously injured. And then the pipe that went through the window. So that video has been put out. But uh, rest assured that these crimes are treated with the utmost importance and our hate <coughs> crimes detectives are, are uh, diligently working to bring all those responsible to justice. Any more crime questions? Miles? Uh, sort of worried. I mean, there was a story in the Daily News the other day of this sort of like uh, group of uh, anti Semitic folks and uh, white nationalists operating in Queens and guys who registered their license plate. So sort of like anti Semitic. Are you worried about that happening? About the rise in uh, hate groups? Well, yeah, let me get uh, Chief Galati from our Intel uh, Bureau to talk about that. Tom? Yes. So, 
Um, you know, I, I won't comment about that particular place, but we, we have a dedicated squad that just looks at after um, all these type of hate groups, whether it's white supremacy, uh, anti-Semit, uh, you know, neo-Nazi uh, type of activity. We work very closely not only uh, with the FBI uh, here in New York, but we also work very closely with our partners in states that have a larger population of these type of hate groups. Um, so we have a very robust program of tracking uh, these individuals? Um, I don't want to say that we're seeing a lot more. I think that we've been investigating a lot of these groups for the past several years. Um, I think that when these high profile cases come up, um, similar to Pittsburgh, it kind of rises a little bit more. But I think that uh, here in, in New York City, uh, along with our federal partners, uh, you know, we know who we need to watch and we are watching them. How much does that help in your investigation of Proud Boys and the work that you guys do in the intelligence space? Uh, I, th I think I'll, I'll give that to Dermot to talk about. Um, there was really good investigative work. I think a, a lot of uh, good video helped us with that as well. Um, but it wasn't our first time. Uh, dealing with uh, this particular group. Um, there was an incident out in NYU a while ago, um, so that assisted us in, in knowing some of the people. Kimberly? The incident in the 79 that you were just talking about, is that the pipe bomb through the window? Is that being now investigated as a crime? It is being investigated as a potential hate crime. It's not a pipe bomb, it's a pipe. Um, <laughs> but in that incident, we have... <laughs> In that incident, we have, um, within roughly a 45-minute, 60-minute period, we have a group of kids, uh, at least seven that are seen. They, they appear to be, and the investigation will bear out uh, the actual ages, but they appear to me to be young, and by young, I mean somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 14 years of age, walking on the sidewalk. We have them within a short period of time, a few blocks, within 45 minutes that we know of, uh, committing three offenses. Again, um, running up behind an individual 14-year-old boy and knocking his hat off and pushing him, uh, pushing a 10-year-old girl to the ground. Um, and, and then the, the last one, I think I have it in the correct order, throwing the pipe through the window. So that's the image that we put out. We're continuing to work that case. We ask for anyone to call Crime Stoppers. Uh, young kids, but we certainly don't want this to escalate into anything or uh, to see anyone injured. So uh, here is the incident here on my left um, that you see. Anyone that has any knowledge whatsoever uh, of these kids, again, my feeling is that they will be uh, residing somewhere near this um, to please call Crime Stoppers. So you're saying that the incidents with the kids, we're looking at that as a hate crime as well, or just kids acting out being that? No, that's being investigated as a potential hate crime, again. Um, when you look at the totality of what we have here, there, there is a nexus to the Jewish faith in all three. Uh, in the first one, uh, you have uh, somebody that commonly dressed that would be recognized as a Jewish male walking down the street. Uh, same in the middle one, same in the last one, uh, in, the t in the location where the uh, pipe was thrown through the window. Yep. Right here. Yes, he was. Yep, so within the confines of the 70th precinct, there's an incident. Um, I, I've watched that video. I don't think we have that video to show. So you see an individual walking, uh, I'll say towards, towards me, if you will. You have an individual coming from my back, walking towards that person. It looks like both individuals possibly, at least one definitely, are on their phone with their heads down, not paying attention to their walking, and they bump into each other. The one individual with the stage crew on the back of his shirt immediately starts swinging wildly at the other individual. Uh, the, the individual that is not the stage crew shirt um, was of the Jewish faith. Uh, right now, that's leaning towards that may not be uh, a hate crime. Uh, that's based on what we see on the video as well as statements of the victim in that case where he believes it's nothing more than a bump, but that will have to be ironed out. That's all preliminary. Ashley? Which, 
In which case is that, Ashley? Yes, sir. All right, uh, Chief Monty, I'll speak about that. Yeah, that was an incident where our, our officers responded over there, and uh, EMS had made a decision that they wanted to wait for uh, a, a paramedic to show up prior to removal. At a point, he stopped. Uh, he was having difficulty breathing. He was carried out to the ambulance, and from the ambulance uh, taken to the hospital, that's where he died. So the, the investigation in that is still continuing. Was, was EMS there right away, or did the officers arrive and, and EMS was there right away. Anything else crime related, Rich? Just to go back to, the, uh, to your statement about the, the perp in the Pittsburgh case, you said he's not, he's not simply a nut. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, and so this is a, a number of conversations I had uh, after, you know, we had the, the, uh, the pipe bombs going through the mail, then, then we had this terrible incident in, um, in Pittsburgh, and a few people have said to me, you know, this, a lot of nutty people in this world, and I just had to correct him and say, this, this guy's not a nut. He's an anti-Semite. There's a difference. And he went into a synagogue and shot 11 people. That's not a nut. That's a guy who hates Jewish people, and he's got a history of it. Yep. Tom? Uh, uh, just uh, overall, I have a question. Uh, no, I'm going to wait. Oh. Yeah. Anybody? So my real, my, my real question is, does anybody have more questions for Chief Pollock? <laughs> <laughs> Provide any more details about the apparent suicide of Dorothy Bruns? Um, right, hold on, we'll get to that. All right, Chief Pollock wants some more questions. He worked very hard <laughs> last night. All right, off topic. Good. Gotcha, hold on, in the back right now. Um, can you provide me more details about um, the apparent suicide of Dorothy Bruns? Do you know what kind of pills were found or what the um, suicide note? And Dermot, you have an, an update on that? Yeah, just what I, what I will say here is uh, our officers responded as well as uh, EMS and the, and the ME to that case. There was a suicide note uh, recovered at the scene as well as uh, evidence of uh, prescription pills. And beyond that, uh, I'll uh, defer to the ME to, to conclude the investigation. At this point, it's being treated as an apparent suicide. Tom. Uh, overall, I'm repeating question. There was a report last week about um, the uh, coin that's being used by the gang squad with the character from The Punisher, who is a vigilante that murders people. Uh, do you think the CO made the right decision uh, to prove that, uh, that? All right, I'm, uh, so the, the Punisher is a fictional character, and I'm gonna let uh, Chief Monaghan speak about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen. Is he a fictional character? Yes. There are challenge coins all over. It started with the military with challenge coins. Every unit has it. It's a morale thing. It's something that uh, creates camaraderie between the officers. It's not just the PD, military. Every business has it. They use a cartoon character. They put out a cartoon character that you could go into any store right now and probably buy a shirt with that cartoon character on it. We leave these decisions up to the COs. Let them make a determination whether it's appropriate or not. The cartoon character that murders people. Yeah, well, okay, so Tom, there's, there's a fine line here. And these, these are the members of the gang squad who are one of the groups primarily responsible for, for pushing homicides and shootings down. They're not out there murdering people. So, you know, it's, it's something that we need to talk, constantly talk to the CEOs about it, make sure that it's appropriate. Uh, but we also, Terry and I are in complete agreement that we also have to leave some decisions. We have to push them down. Uh, to lower levels, so we don't want to micromanage. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm hoping we can get uh, some update on the crackdown on private carters. Uh, next steps on that. Now's yeah. the time for that question. Why don't you do this first, and then we'll go right to you. All right. Obviously, we did the one-week crackdown, uh, and we had no problem finding uh, finding violations. Mm -hmm. Total, we gave out 1,070 summonses. We inspected 142 carton trucks. We put 132 of those trucks out of service, and we towed away 17 different trucks. So we're, we're continuing to work with the BEC, the Business Integrity Commission, and uh, just because the initiative is over doesn't mean the enforcement's over. Our cops around the city are gonna be looking for violations, and we'll be stopping them. We will be inspecting trucks as we go forward. Hopefully that we sent the message out to these companies that uh, we will be out there and we will be conducting enforcements and we won't tolerate uh, any of their actions. My question for the mayor was that, no problem. My question for the mayor was that, you know, the city holds 
hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts with some of these companies. I'm wondering if uh, the city is and NYPD are tracking which companies it's giving these tickets out to and whether uh, there could be more severe penalties like severing some of these contracts. Yes and yes. Miles. Uh, the Business Integrity Commission has 11 investigators, and, and they've been around for 16 years. And this is sort of the, the, the biggest enforcement effort, and uh, we've seen 43 deaths. Is it a little too late? Why, why is Vic uh, still not empowered to do more? It's the agency that's directly responsible for the industry. Well, Vic needs more power, and this is one of the things we talked about, and I think we're going to get to resolution on that very soon with the City Council, and I, you know, we're going to keep adding the resources needed. I think this is an issue that has grown, I said this uh, a week or two ago, has grown in everyone's understanding really intensely in, in recent months, and uh, we're going to respond accordingly. So. I, you know, I understand to some extent there is a almost constitutional desire on the part of the media to assign blame. Right now, I want to fix the problem. So, <laughs> sure, sure. But I'm saying, uh, and again, I, I always try and remind you guys of this central concept. Uh, when did we all understand there was a problem? From my point of view, hearing the public discourse constantly, you know, talking to you guys, town hall meetings, radio call-ins, listening to advocates, listening to elected officials, this issue I certainly did not hear as um, one of such profound importance even just a couple of years ago. I'm very glad it's been surfaced. I think it needed to be surfaced. It's now going to be treated with extreme uh, focus because we need to go after all of these companies that are causing any kind of health and safety problems. There have to be real severe consequences. I got no problem if a company is harming the people in New York City, doing everything we can to put them out of business. So, you know, we need to strengthen uh, the laws around this, the penalties, uh, the ability of BIC to enforce. Again, I think that's coming very soon in the council. If there's more personnel needed, we're ready to do that. Uh, but we're, there's going to be very serious consequences for the companies that have done this. Well, that, that's not over yet. No, second row. Uh, yeah, the question about e-bikes. Um, so, with this crackdown, there was this idea that the, the businesses would be fine, right, instead of delivery workers who are riding e-bikes. Um, <coughs> you know, I've heard from cases where the workers are still getting the ticket and the, the cops aren't making any effort to actually find the businesses instead. And in some cases, Oath is actually dismissing the tickets because they were given to the wrong person. Um, I'm wondering, kind of, how you all are addressing that in terms of training officers on the policy um, and how to enforce it, um, and kind of what you make of this this pattern. Of, of all right, uh, yeah, Chief Chan will talk about our enforcement efforts. Tom, uh, we've met with some of the uh, the advocates on the uh, e-bikes and things of that nature. Ultimately, uh, we've trained out the officers. We have an opportunity also to issue summonses to the private business themselves. We do have uh, entrepreneurs out there. Now we have e-bike delivery person that may not necessarily work for a specific restaurant, but they work for a group, and they respond to the restaurant, pick up the food, and make the delivery. Therefore, we cannot issue a summons to a specific business itself because they, uh, they may be covering 10 different restaurants at any given time. Ultimately, our officers are trained, and they are issuing summonses, and uh, again, the old court will make their determinations out there. The people do have an opportunity to get those bicycles or e-bikes back, but ultimately, uh, uh, the pedal assist bikes are legal out there on the street. Uh, we certainly encourage people to utilize them, and again, these bikes, uh, e-bikes that have throttles, those are illegal, and um, that's the responsibility of the people, and we certainly encourage them to transition over to uh, the pedal assist bikes, which are legal and certainly operated safely. Let me let me just jump in. I, I'm not familiar with the details, but I want to be crystal clear. We announced this; it couldn't have been clearer. And I'm going to say to my very valued colleagues, if we need to retrain uh, folks at the precinct level, we should. It's abundantly clear: if someone works for a specific restaurant and is making those deliveries, the restaurant should be penalized. 
Now, Chief's point is very important. Some people don't just work for one, one restaurant, work for an a intermediary company, if you will, in which case we should go after that company. But if there's any gray about the fact that we're not trying to go after the little guy, we're trying to go after the employer, we'll do a better job of getting that message across. Two more here. Dean. When it comes to uh, the apparent suicide of Dorothy Bruns, did the note suggest that the suicide was because of this horrible accident? And your reaction to this, Mayor, because I know you were very upset about this case. Yeah, Dean, I'm not going to speak to the, the contents of the note. Look, I, I want to say, you know, anytime someone takes their own life, it, it's profoundly sad. And obviously, you know, all we have focused on in terms of mental health is getting people the help they need and getting people to come forward with their problems uh, so that we can avert tragedies like this. You know, that, that's the reality across the board. This is just an extremely painful case from moment one, and I wish, I wish none of this had come to pass. But what's abundantly clear at the same time is we have to change our laws so that we don't have any more tragedies like the one she was originally involved in with uh, those who lost their lives. Yep. Rich. So the private carding industry <coughs> used to have a reputation of being involved with the mob. Is that... Uh, do you know that that's true uh, in the past, and is it still true now? Does anybody have any sense? Yeah, if that was something that uh, Pick was originally established for, to work with us, with our OSED unit, to, uh, to, to try and get the mob out of it. And as we look at it now, we don't see the mob connections out there were in the past. A lot of that had been removed. setting. All right, I want to, I want to say a couple of things up front about Election Day. Uh, take questions on anything related to the election here or around the country, and then uh, we'll go to other topics thereafter. Um, you know, you'd like to be celebrating this morning the turnout we had in this city because it was extraordinary. You know, everything we've talked about these last weeks is about increasing participation in our democracy. And people did that in New York City. They came out in droves because they wanted to participate. That is very good news. The really bad news is that the Board of Elections simply can't function. It cannot do its job. And uh, look, weeks and weeks and weeks of notice that this was going to be a, a higher turnout election than typical. Uh, the, the size of the ballot was not a shock. The Board of Elections was planning on that for a long time. The fact that it might rain, you know, it rains sometimes on Election Day. This is not a news flash. So what did people experience? They experienced broken scanners in dozens and dozens of polling uh, places. In some cases, all the scanners were broken. 
Uh, many New Yorkers couldn't vote in privacy. Uh, many New Yorkers stood in lines at least an hour, in some cases two or three hours. It's as if there was a purposeful plan to make voting as unappealing as possible. Now, I don't think that's the case, but I think the fact that uh, it had that result is why the status quo is broken and must be changed. The Board of Elections can't do its job. It is making it harder for people to vote, not easier. It is part of the problem. It must change. So a host of things need to happen. They need to happen urgently. Uh, in terms of the board itself, uh, at minimum, uh, there must be a law passed in Albany to professionalize the board's operation, modernize them, give the executive director the power to actually run the agency like any other agency. I said uh, yesterday, if uh, kids showed up to school and, and schools didn't open, or if folks went to their police precinct and the police precinct wasn't open, uh, New Yorkers would be outraged. Well, uh, we had poll sites that didn't open on time. How is that possible in 2018? There's no redundancy, there's no follow-up. It's just not run like a professional organization. So there has to be a change in the structure. That's one version that can be done. There are others as well, but whatever it is, the current Board of Elections approach must be ended, and it must be ended before 2020, which I predict, not a news flash, will be arguably the highest turnout election that any of us have seen in decades. Uh, further, we could relieve a lot of pressure on the uh, election day operations if we would do the things the states all over the country do, red states and blue states, early voting, uh, vote by mail, uh, no-fault absentee ballots, uh, same-day registration, take all of the roadblocks out of the process. Um, finally, look. It's gotten to a point where it's quite clear the board does not want to change. There are times when you look at a problem in an agency and you hear a lot of penitence, you hear a lot of willingness to reform. This ain't that. Uh, I offered $20 million repeatedly to the Board of Elections to make a series of managerial reforms. I, I have never encountered uh, an organization that said no to $20 million because it required some improvements in their operations. In all of government, and Dean can attest to this, both in his current role and formerly as budget director, if you say to an agency, we're going to give you a substantial amount of money, but we expect performance improvements, uh, folks say, let's do it. Let's go right now. I accept. Not the Board of Elections. So this is an arcane institution. It must be changed once and for all. Uh, the other thing I want to say is, you know, in terms of uh, the results yesterday, uh, I am overall very, very pleased, and I want to start with a phrase that I uh, learned early in life because, as some of you know, I grew up in the congressional district of uh, one of our greatest leaders in American history, Tip O'Neill, and he said all politics is local, so I want to start local. Uh, I am so proud of the people of New York City for deciding decisively that we needed a stronger democracy, that we needed more civic participation, that we needed to get big money out of politics. Uh, overwhelming vote for the yes position on all three ballot questions. I think a, a powerful message sent by the people of the city that we need to change, that we need to keep improving our democracy. And I think it's going to help efforts uh, in the state, starting with the state, which must have campaign finance reform, uh, but also around the country to see that the biggest city in America just took a big step toward getting big money out of politics and uh, rewarding low-dollar community donations. I think that's a really important step forward. On the, uh, also uh, in the city, um, and I'll speak as a uh, Democrat, uh, powerful results uh, that uh, suggest uh, real uh, movement in terms of the values that Democrats hold in this city. Looks like uh, the state Senate seat uh, in southern Brooklyn will flip to the Democrats. Obviously, the House seat in Brooklyn and Staten Island has flipped to the, the U.S. House seat has flipped. Those are very, very good developments. Uh, in terms of the state, uh, the fact that we not only have a Democratic majority in the state Senate, but a resounding Democratic majority is going to allow for a host of progress for the state and going to allow some really important initiatives to finally be acted on. Uh, we've been waiting for it for years, in some cases, decades. 
uh, most especially uh, reform to our election process, campaign finance reform, finally getting a solution uh, for the MTA. I mean, huge changes uh, could come from the fact that we now have a strong, clear Democratic majority in the state Senate. Uh, great progress in terms of representation. First African-American woman as attorney general, first African-American woman to lead uh, a legislative body in this state. Uh, Andrea Stewart-Cousins as majority leader of the state Senate uh, is going to do an outstanding job and someone that I think everyone agrees uh, we all can work with productively. So uh, really happy with those results. And then look, the big picture on the country, uh, the number one agenda item for Democrats and progressives was to win back the House. Strong result there. Um, very happy about that. Very happy about the governorships that flipped. I think it's seven at this point and some very crucial states, uh, most notably uh, Michigan and Wisconsin. Um, some of the ballot measures that passed were extraordinary in terms of, for example, a reenfranchisement of voters in Florida, uh, the ballot measures that passed to expand Medicaid coverage, I mean, all speak to some real bigger changes coming in this country. Uh, would have been fantastic to win back the U.S. Senate. I think uh, people knew that was a very, very tall order. Uh, there were some, also some real tough losses in terms of some of the, the most impressive uh, candidates. Andrew Gillum's a great example in Florida. But I also think uh, even in defeat, some of the uh, candidates uh, showed that real change is starting to happen in their states and that that type of candidate, uh, a clear progressive with a strong message is going to, you're going to see more and more of them coming forward. So uh, on balance, um, I think it was a very good night, still a huge amount of work to do. But I felt uh, in my heart that the real question uh, in terms of last night would be uh, how it set a pathway to the future, especially the 2020 election. I feel very good about what I saw, and I feel very good about the turnout levels around the country. So that's just a quick overview on, on the election. Obviously, the Board of Elections situation. I want to see if there's any questions on anything related to elections, and then we'll go to uh, other topics as well. Go ahead, Gloria. Uh, one, strengthen rent regulation, protect affordable housing. Two, uh, fix the MTA, provide uh, a permanent funding source for our subways and buses. Three, uh, continue our progress on education funding and on having the power uh, to keep fixing our schools. Yes. Look, I, there's the bottom line. Mike Ryan has to make very clear he's ready to make major changes. He is a capable person, and he has made some improvements. But uh, he has to be ready to accept that $20 million and the specific reforms required. Uh, he has to be ready to take on uh, a role that is more professional and more aggressive if we can get the state legislation passed. If he has any hesitation about doing those things, he should leave. If he's ready to do those things, I would give him a chance. Yes? Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you're optimistic about the state Senate and its uh, role in the MTA. Neither the state Senate nor the Assembly have held uh, an oversight hearing on the MTA in years. So what exactly is uh, your vision uh, for the state uh, legislature and how they hold uh, the MTA? Uh, I think that's your, your, your sort of apples and oranges on that one. Um, Oversight hearings and how they go about that, I'm not familiar with it, and that's not my concern in this instance. My concern is that we need a funding source. Uh, I think the uh, fast-forward plan that Mr. Byford put forward is, by and large, the right approach. So uh, there's a lot that needs to be improved at the MTA, obviously, and, and our board members are working on that, uh, and I think the legislature should push on that. But the most essential problem is a funding problem, 30 to $40 billion. Uh, we need that to be voted on in this coming legislative session in Albany. And I believe the state Senate's ready to take that on now that it has new leadership. Yeah. It's a voted legislature. I mean, look, I believe it is 37 states in this country that either have uh, early voting, 
uh, vote by mail, same day registration, or some combination of those three. So 37 states, including some of the reddest, some of the smallest, have the fundamental reforms that somehow uh, the Empire State doesn't have. And we should be ashamed of ourselves. And everyone in Albany needs to be held accountable for this. It must change. Uh, you know, we've seen 38 million Americans early voted. 38 million people is stunning. It's something we should be proud of. Uh, if we gave that right to New Yorkers, they'd use it. And then that would take a huge amount of pressure off Election Day. It is simply a majority vote of uh, the Assembly and the Senate and the signature of the governor. That's all it takes, and they should get it done uh, by April 1st. Yes, Willie. Um, uh, on Albany and the Senate, what is your approach going to be to getting your agenda through Albany when it comes to funding for the MTA? Are you going to ban uh, some mix or some issues in the food? On the second question, uh, my position remains, I still believe the millionaire's tax is the single best solution. It's the most reliable, it's the most consistent, it's the most progressive. I also think it's the most politically viable solution. Uh, I know there is real interest in it in the state senate. In fact, the uh, deputy leader, Mike Gennaris, is the sponsor of the, uh, now to be deputy leader, is the sponsor of the millionaire's tax proposal. Uh, so I think that's the best option. Uh, you could say, well, what, it might take more than one thing. I think that really could be the case. On congestion pricing, I have said I think the Governor's Commission actually uh, improved upon any previous proposal. I've talked to the Governor about it. It's something I'm certainly going to keep an open mind on. There are issues I have raised that I think need to be addressed in terms of uh, fairness vis-a-vis -vis, uh, congestion pricing. But I guess what I'd say to wrap it together is, Something's got to give. It's got to be one of these two things or something else or some combination. But I think everyone who cares about this issue, and I would say it to everyone in the media, all the editorial boards, focus all your attention between now and April 1st on a long-term funding source for the MTA because this is our best chance to get it done and the best chance we're going to have for a long time. On your uh, second question of approach, um, look, it's a whole new ballgame. Um, first of all, it's not three men in the room anymore. Uh, and it's, uh, at one point it was kind of four men in a room, and uh, one of them was a Republican and one of them was a Republican sympathizer, uh, meaning uh, Jeff Klein. So, you know, the difference now is you've got, uh, in the two leaders of the legislature, uh, two people who are devoted to making real change and who work well together. Uh, and from my point of view, we're going to be able to have a kind of dialogue we never had before. Now, of course, these are still complex issues, and everything will take time. But, you know, I think unquestionably there's going to be a possibility now around uh, election reform we didn't have, campaign finance reform we didn't have, MTA that we didn't have, uh, obviously on in strengthening rent regulation. Uh, Rebney uh, had a particular... Uh, uh, influence over the uh, state senate Republicans. That's gone now. Uh, RSA as well. That's gone now. So the door is wide open for strengthening rent regulation. So I, I think it's a very powerful moment, and I look forward to working well with them. Please. Well, it's a different reality now. I mean, look, I mean, one, obviously, uh, the governor and I are, have had differences, and we've also had times that we've worked well together. One of the most recent was on the speed cameras issue. We remain in dialogue regularly. And we've both said publicly and privately we want to try in you know, his new term uh, to do better at finding common ground, and I'm going to work on that consistently. There will still be disagreements philosophically and in terms of the interests of New York City. But I think uh, the atmosphere, the center of gravity has shifted by definition. It's now a democratic government. And that's going to change the entire dialogue, I think, for the better. Yes, you're off. Uh, Mayor, are you planning to kind of revive the push for the mansion tax as well? And now that the midterms are over, do you expect, uh, and, and with the changes in Albany, do you expect perhaps to take uh, more trips to Albany and fewer out of, out of the state? 
On the uh, mansion tax, I still think it's the right idea. I, I will caution the obvious. There's a lot on the docket immediately. So uh, I, I'm not going to tell you whether that's going to be one of the uh, first items because we have to talk to the Senate leadership and the Assembly leadership and see what their focus is. When I was asked earlier, the one, two, three, that's the one, two, three. That's, that's the bread and butter that we're going to focus on first. Uh, on the question of uh, Albany, look, uh, I don't think it's about trips. I think it's about what gets the job done. There's, you know, there's this extraordinary new technology, the telephone, that has <laughs> really been very effective as well. Uh, Whatever is going to get the job done. If going up there more is part of what helps us get things done for New York City, of course I'll go up there. If, I, if there's another way to do it, that's great. Um, the, the more important thing than how many trips is what's the nature of the dialogue. And I feel very, very comfortable uh, that uh, with Andrew Stewart-Cousins, with Carl Hastie, there's a constant positive constructive dialogue, and I think that's going to be very good for the whole state and very good for New York City. Uh, and, you know, I've spoken to uh, the national picture more times than I can count, and I'm always happy to repeat, but I'm going to keep doing that work as I see fit uh, to have a bigger impact for this city. Uh, and I think uh, what's happening now around the country is opening the doors to a lot of changes that New York City needs that can only be done on the federal level. Uh, let's go back there. Um, what are your thoughts on Dan Donovan losing to Max Rose last night? Um, as you know, uh, Rose has been critical of you and Democrats and Republicans uh, in the establishment. Um, do you think it's going to be hard for Rose as a junior congressman to go to Washington and walk, uh, work with his colleagues given that you know he's been critical of Democrats and Republicans and he said they, that they've all got to go? <laughs> I don't know him. I don't know how he approaches, you know, working with people. I, I think, uh, you know, folks in Washington are going to try and work together. I mean, that's my assumption. There's obviously always differences in such a big uh, body as uh, the House delegation, Democratic delegation in, in Washington from around the country. Look, it's a very impressive victory. Uh, he should be very proud. Uh, and I think he uh, did a great job uh, going to the grassroots and, and telling people it was time for a change, especially given what was happening in the country. I assume he'll be able to work with people. Gloria. Mary, you mentioned that already. Can you just so that, talk a little bit more about mayoral control? What do you have to do to make sure you don't keep getting these yearly extensions? Um, how do you get an extension that lasts longer? Can you just talk about your strategy on that? Look, I mean, it's, it's, we're just starting, obviously, and the most important thing is for the uh, state Senate leadership to have time uh, to talk to its conference and decide how they're going to approach things. But what I can say at the outset is um, we're talking about uh, leadership that I think is uh, open-minded, communicative, respectful of the needs in New York City. Uh, it's an entirely different reality. And on the substance, Look, um, the Assembly consistently uh, put forward a vision of a three-year extension. That's, that's something they voted in the One House bills regularly. The governor in his uh, uh, budget address, the state to the state, has put forward a three-year vision. Um, that's the coin of the realm for Democrats. The state Senate uh, majority will now look at the overall situation but there is something on the table that has previously pervaded in, in Albany, and I think that's important. I think that's how the conversation will begin. Rich. So uh, Mr. Bloomberg said that uh, after these elections, he would contemplate running for president. If he were to call you for advice, <laughs> what advice would you give? This is a colorful question. I like it already. If you call me for advice, continue. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with what I truly feel about him. Uh, there were some things he did as mayor I agree with very uh, intensely, particularly on the environment, climate, uh, immigration, um, gun control, uh, public health. There were a host of things I disagreed with intensely on income inequality, on education, on affordable housing, a whole host of issues. Um, I think he's a, a, a very capable guy. I don't believe he is in the mainstream of the Democratic Party. I don't believe uh, that we need another billionaire 
uh, in leadership from either the Democrat or Republican Party. So uh, I would just tell him I think he's barking up the wrong tree. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just really to follow up on the carding uh, issue, um, there was a push that the city council and the administration was thinking about turning the carding, completely overhaul the carding system and making zones where you know, one yeah. company is responsible for the zone. Do you think that will solve these problems? And also, what's the timetable on that? Soon is the timetable. Do I think it uh, will solve all these problems? No, I think it's a part of it. I, I think it's a part of uh, making it an industry that serves the city better. But I think the underlying issues, as we talked about earlier, are deeper and are about regulation and about uh, having tougher consequences for wrongdoers. Thanks, everyone. I, I have to say, I, you, you all, your, your question sequencing surprises me. OK. <laughs> Sure, what do you want to know? Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the deal is there, and talk about concerns that Long Island City would be overwhelmed, the services, transit, Okay. On the first part, look, I, I think everyone has watched with, um, you could say admiration, you could say amazement, whatever word you want, how closely held this process has been uh, at Amazon. And I can say, for a fact, at this hour, we do not know what the final result will be. We do not know if it's one location, two locations, and if we're one of them, and how big. We don't, just don't know. There's all sorts of discussion going on. We've been in dialogue with Amazon for months and months, and, and a very intense dialogue. But we still, at this hour, don't know what the final result will be. And because they have made such a point of keeping their final decision close, it's just not prudent to guess you know, or, or surmise on the, you know, but again, I believe, I felt it from day one, the moment I heard about the second headquarters concept, I thought we were the single best location because if it is about talent pool, we have the strongest talent pool in the nation. Um, on the question of Long Island City, again, one, they still have not confirmed finally that they're even coming to New York City in a way, shape, any way, shape or form or that it is Long Island City. But if you said, uh, if, it, if it were to be, what would it mean? Look, I think Long Island City uh, has become uh, an extraordinarily important uh, neighborhood for the future of Queens and the future of New York City. And it has been growing both residentially and in terms of jobs. I think uh, this would consolidate not only Long Island City's role, but uh, for Queens, I think it would be a huge boost and uh, yes, there are real development pressures to be navigated, um, but they can be navigated. Uh, we already were working on a lot of uh, crucial infrastructure investments. By definition, we're gonna have to do more. But it's an area of extraordinary possibility uh, for the city. And, uh, you know, uh, because we're New Yorkers, we get a little bit, I, I don't wanna just say jaded, but our perspective's a little funny. You know, we have almost 4.5 million jobs, so someone comes along talking about 25,000 or 50,000 new jobs, and we're like, a lot of New Yorkers kinda like, oh, that's nice. You know, anywhere else that would be front page for a month, right? It's just a seismic number of jobs. But it's also about the fact that it will allow us, I believe this in my heart, because I've really been focused on the tech community, and I believe the tech community finally consolidating here for the long term is mission critical to the future of New York City, to our economy, jobs, tax base, everything. And I think this is the, the sort of last piece of the puzzle. So yeah, there'll be hassles, there'll be challenges, but I think we can accommodate them. We will have to invest in infrastructure. I think it'll be worth it. Thanks, everyone. More complex discussion, but we have to see if they're even real about this.